Okay, I'll get started. So, uh, hi, my name is Joe Burton. I work at Google, and I'm going to be talking about um, a proposed uh, proposed new capability for BPF that I'm calling BPF Map Tracing, and the use case that motivates it, um, namely hot updates of stateful programs. So this presentation is an RFC and a status update. Um, I presented this work externally um, a few months ago, and I've been working on it on and off since then. It has been prototyped, and uh, the stuff that I'm going to be presenting here can be sent upstream soon. Uh, but there's still some open questions that I want feedback on. And with that, um, so I'm organizing the presentation into five sections. We'll go over the, the uh, concrete use case that motivates the set of kernel changes I'm proposing. Uh, we'll cover an abstract model of the problem and the solution. We'll cover the concrete kernel changes and some interesting uh, selections from the source code. Uh, I'll cover my open questions, and then we'll summarize everything at the end. OK, so first, let's start with our motivation, um, which is a staple program that Somewhat surprisingly, we weren't able to upgrade. Um, so BPF DIN and CAP is a set of programs that we developed at Google. And we're actually going to be covering this in a later session at LPC. Um, so if you want all the details, uh, please visit that session. Um, hopefully, I don't butcher it too, too badly. Uh, but at the highest level, what DIN and CAP does is it allows applications to dynamically specify the source and destination IPs that they um, want to use when encapsulating the packets on a, on a socket. So applications can opt in a socket by invoking a set socket, which will call a C group set socket program. Um, and then a TC program will actually perform the encapsulation. On the right hand side, you can see a graphical representation of this. So we have our set sock opt hook, a program that gets invoked, it writes some data into a map. And then when you actually start sending data, the TC hook will invoke a program which will read data from the map and use it to perform encapsulation. Um, so the entire application uses three maps, and we'll go through them now. The first map is uh, called DIN and CAP map. It's an SK storage map, which is a kind of local storage map. It records the IPs that um, should be used when we're encapsulating the packets on a socket. The set socket program is what uh, populates it. And the TC program that performs the encapsulation is what um, consumes the data in the map. So if we lose the data in this map, um, for whatever reason, uh, the side effect is going to be that packets that are sent from that socket are not going to be encapsulated. Um, so what user mode is going to see is they're going to see, I made my set sock opt, it succeeded, I started sending data, and it was encapsulated for a while, and then at some point, it was no longer encapsulated. So losing the data breaks a contract with user mode, so the data in this map is absolutely critical. Next, we have a map called SYN and CAB map. It is an LRU hash table, meaning that when it fills up, uh, the last updated entry will be removed uh, or replaced. And what it does is it stores the outer IPs of encapsulated SYN packets. So an encapsulated SYN will come into our C group. It'll hit our C group SKB slash ingress program. It'll, par it'll detect if it's encapsulated. It'll parse out the IPs, and it'll put them in this map. Um, then when we, uh, when we start sending data back out on the socket, the TC program will look in this map. Um, and if it finds an entry, it'll encapsulate using those IPs. So if we lose the data in the map, what's going to happen is that the TC program will drop a SYNAC. Um, that's for technical reasons that I won't go into. It's just like how the implementation works. Um, but the important part is that you know, we don't want to lose the data in this map, but if we do, you know, we're going to drop a SYNAC, and so I believe that that means that another, that another SYN will come in, and uh, this time we won't lose the data, and we'll respond with an encapsulated SYNAC. So losing the data in this map is bad, but it's not fatal. 
And finally, we have a third map. It's called reflection status. It's a per CPU hash table. All it does is it counts up the number of errors of a given type. So the key is an enum of like an error class and the value is an integer, just a counter. Um, our uh, Seeger BuskyB slash ingress program is what uh, mutates the data in the map and a user space app is what consumes it. And it's essentially just for debugability. Um, so if we lose the data in the map, it really doesn't matter. Um, it's not relevant to policy enforcement. So in summary, we have three maps. They all have different types. If we lose the state, it each one has a different level of severity. Um, and I, I kind of glossed over this, but also the way that we modify the state in the map in each case is different. You know, the top one, we get a pointer to a cell and then we update through that pointer. Uh, the second one, we do that kind of access pattern where we get a pointer to the cell with BPF map update element. And we can also delete using BPF map delete element. And then the last one, we do a lookup element. Sorry, I misspoke. The sending cap, we update and delete. So we don't get a pointer to a cell at any point. And then we'll reflection, reflection status, we get a pointer to a cell and we also do an update. Um, so the important part is that we have different types of maps, different uh, impact of state loss, and also the way we modify them is different. Um, but we're gonna drill down on the Dinencap map um, because it's the most critical. And we're going to think about how we can up upgrade this set of programs. So this is the critical subset of Dinencap. I covered some other maps. Um, those are used to implement additional features that we'll leave out for now. Um, so we have two programs in red. Each one of them is attached to an event in blue, and we have a map in green. Um, yeah, we already kind of went through this. So naively, the way we can upgrade this is we can load a new copy of each program. Uh, you know, say we have a new version, and we can also load a new copy of the map. We can do a bulk uh, copy of the data in the map, and then we can swap each of the programs attached to the events uh, using like a BPF link update. The problem is that, say at the red line, we start doing our upgrade. We do a bulk copy of all the data in the map from the old map to the new map. And then we, and then by pure chance, an application does a set sock opt. Um, so that's going to invoke this, the old program because it's still attached and that's going to update the old map. Um, and then, you know, that finishes and we continue doing our migration. Now we swap in the new programs. And it just so happens now that uh, it's an, at this point, we're done with our migration. Now the application starts sending data and uh, the new version of the program is attached. So we look in the new version of the map, but as we said just a moment ago, we wrote the data to the old version of the map after we finished doing the bulk migration. So the encapsulation program is not going to see this data. Um, and that's going to break our contract with user mode. And that's a problem. So the ramifications of this is that we can't upgrade programs like this um, because it would introduce race conditions and the possibility of loss of state. And in certain applications like this one, losing state breaks a contract. Um, also, we can't roll back our agent arbitrarily since we can't um, reload our program and because we can't afford to lose our state. So um, if we were to roll back our agent, uh, you know, say, say we roll out a new agent and a new program, and then we roll back the agent, well, now we have new programs and an old agent, and now the old agent has to know how to talk to the new programs. So we can solve that actually by uh, before rolling out new programs, rolling out a new agent that knows how to talk to them, waiting a few release cycles, uh, and then rolling out new programs. Because then we can roll back our agent a few versions and everything works out because it knows how to talk to the new, pro new programs. Um, but it adds latency to releases. And in my opinion, one of the worst side effects of this problem is that developers need to know about the problem and keep track of it. Um, 
So I'd like to solve this and uh, make it generally possible to upgrade stateful programs without loss of state. So that's it for the motivation. Um, so let's go into an abstract model of the problem and of the solution that I'm proposing. So we're going to be considering how we can upgrade this program set. It should, this is the same picture as we had a couple slides ago, except we removed the data and cap stuff and just made it more abstract. So we have two programs. Each one is attached to an event and we have one map. You know, the program zero writes data into the map. Program one reads data and makes some decision based on that data. So now let's upgrade it. First thing we can do is we can, up, we can load a new version of the program set. And because we haven't attached the programs to events, this has no effect. Next, and this is the crux of the proposal, we can attach a copy on write handler to the old map. Any updates to the old map will invoke this uh, copy on write handler, which is a BPF program. Um, this uh, Copy on right handler can then uh, it can read it can so it sees the data that was written into the old map and it can write it into a new map. It can perform any um, transformations to the data that it needs to. Say we changed the layout of the structure, or we added or removed some members. Uh, we can do that inside the copy on right handler and write it into the new map. With this in place, we can perform a bulk transfer of all the data in map zero uh, to map zero prime. Um, we can do this with an iterator. Um, so logically, but okay, I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. So this is, there are two edge cases we need to think about because now we have two programs that are looking at the same map at the same time. Um, the first edge case, the bulk transfer program it's effectively going to iterate over a map. Let's say that we're looking at the thousandth element in a thousand element array. And while we're in the middle of migrating that element, the zeroth element is updated. Um, if we didn't have the copy on right handler, this update would not propagate to the new map. But because it's there, it does get propagated. So this edge case is handled. The second edge case to think about is um, Say we start migrating the element of a map, and then uh, and then event zero fires. Uh, so yeah, we start my sorry, we start migrating the element of a map using the bulk transfer routine. Event zero fires and invokes program zero, which then updates this cell by chance. The copy on write handler could then uh, could then fire. It could write this new data to the new map. Then we could be scheduled back into the bulk transfer routine, which could then overwrite the new data with the outdated uh, data that it was looking at. Um, so this is just an edge case we need to handle. Essentially, it's just a concurrency problem. So we need to be able to serialize access to this map. Um, so essentially, an important detail is that we need to be able to acquire a spin lock in both the copy on write and the bulk transfer routines. Um, but assuming we can do that, uh, this should all work. Next, we can start swapping programs one by one. We have to be a little careful about the order that we do it in. Um, the, in general, the way you would do this is with the topological sort of the programs according to the data dependencies. In this case, what that means is that we would swap in our data consumer, which is the new version of program one, uh, first. So uh, we can see that its data dependency is met because I've been thinking of this in terms of whether the data in map uh, zero prime was written in the recent or distant past. If it was written in the recent past, essentially what happened is event zero fires, program zero fires, Map zero gets written to, copy on right handler runs, and it propagates the data to map zero prime. Then event one fires, and then program one prime fires. Uh, it reads the data from map zero prime. And because the copy on right handler propagated the data, um, the data dependency is satisfied. 
So any uh, writes that are done in the recent past are going to be uh, present in the map. Likewise, if there was a write in the distant past, we go through the, uh, the bulk transfer chain. Um, the bulk transfer routine will have copied that data over. And so program one prime will have its data dependency met. So no matter what, it looks like uh, if we follow the scheme, the data dependencies that program one prime will have will be satisfied. And now we can swap in our data producer. And at this point, we're basically done because we have migrated over to program set E1. Uh, there was no point in time where the data consumers data dependencies were not satisfied. Um, and we just have these extra migration routines attached to a map, which is written to by a program which is not attached. So now we can just unload those migration programs and we are done. Uh, we can just unload the old version of the program at this point. The nice thing about this scheme is that we didn't make any assumptions about the maps, um, about the nature of the change to the map that we're doing. So the we could change the capacity of the map, we could change its type, say from like an array to a hash table. Uh, we could change the layout of the data inside the map. So you have a, a structure with five elements in the old version, and you want to add a six element to the middle of the structure. You could do that with this kind of scheme. Um, and I think you could do more. I, I imagine you could probably split one map into multiple or combine maps, but that's getting ahead of ourselves. So that's it. That's the theory. Um, and so now let's talk about how we're going to implement it with kernel changes. So this is a an example program um, that can that will be tracing the BPF map update element calls to a map called traced map. We have some syntactic sugar with libpf um, that will essentially let you just automatically load and attach this program. Um, the this is a uh, tracing program, BPF prog deck tracing. Um, it has a context to a new structure, BPF map trace context update element. The structure, uh, the type of the structure depends on the, um, the type of the update that we're doing to the map. So for an update, we have a key and a value. Uh, we can read them, it's read only. We can't uh, you know, modify this memory. Uh, we can apply any transformation that we feel like. Um, I just used this function as an example that you can do whatever you want, not that this is actually useful. And then you can propagate the transformed data to a new map. So the context that these programs can receive, uh, there's one context for each kind of uh, a map update that is supported. Uh, the patch set currently supports BPF map update elements and BPF map delete elements. And um, in the open questions, we'll talk about how to handle more. Um, but this is kind of what's done now because it's easy. Um, so fundamentally, we have to be able to attach programs to maps. So we do this with a BPF link create. Um, we have an enum, which has one value for each kind of uh, for each kind of map update that we can trace. And so there's one for update and delete element. Um, we have a structure which takes that enum as well as the file descriptor of a map. And then when you're doing your link create, you pass in a pointer to this structure and the size of the, the structure for compatibility. So because we're attaching uh, programs to maps and completely arbitrarily, I felt like it'd be more useful if we could attach a list of programs to a map instead of just one. Um, when, we in, when we update a map from a program, we can wind up invoking a cascade of programs which update maps, which invoke more tracing programs, which update maps. And so you wind up, uh, you can wind up having a graph of programs and maps uh, related to a map. Um, 
you know, because of tracing. And if the graph has a loop, then we're in trouble because uh, you'll just get into an infinite cycle of updating a map and tracing that update and then doing the update again. So simple example, this is a length one infinite loop where you know, we have our tracing program, it's tracing a map called traced underscore map. Uh, so whenever there's an update to this map, we'll invoke this program and we will update the map, which will invoke the tracer, which is this function, which will update the map. So it's an infinite loop and we can't allow this. Um, you can also have a, a longer infinite loop. We won't go through the example in detail. You can see we're tracing map zero, updating map one, tracing map one, updating map zero, and then you would just get into a loop of just updating and tracing forever. So when we are doing a BPF link create, we just have to do a simple depth first search on the graph of uh, programs and maps. Um, so yeah, on the graph of um, programs tracing a map and yeah, maps being updated by the programs recursively. And it's just, it's a very simple depth first search. I won't go line by line through this algorithm. Um, but yeah, it's fairly efficient at link create time. We can just make sure that this graph is a DAG. Cool. So um, we had to modify struct BPF map because now there is a possible list of, an optional list of programs associated with each map. Um, so we have this structure, it contains a list um, of programs and it's RCU protected. Um, arbitrarily, we decided to have an array of these lists with one uh, list for each type of tracing. Um, so you could have one list for map update element, a different list for map delete element. Um, we enforce a maximum length on these lists, just uh, pretty much just because it seemed like a good idea. Um, and that's what this array is for, just to make those length checks efficient. And then we have a mutex that protects writes to these two arrays. So readers can, um, readers don't need to acquire the mutex. They can just iterate with RCU primitives. Writers have to acquire the mutex. And then finally, we have a pointer to this structure in our struct BPF map. Um, this is one weird thing I wanted to call out. We don't use a mutex to protect this pointer. Um, when you instantiate a struct BPF map, we will leave this pointer to be null. Um, and then when we attach the first program, we will do a, an atomic compare and exchange uh, to populate it. The intent is that when we are um, when we're uh, deciding if, when we're trying to figure out if we have to invoke tracing programs uh, after doing a map update, we want that check to be really cheap in the common case. So we don't want to have to acquire a mutex to traverse into this pointer. Um, the side effect of this is that once you attach a tracing program uh, to a map, you can't null initialize this pointer anymore. Um, essentially just because um, essentially because you'd have to, well, yeah, because there's no mutex, that's basically it. So moving on. Um, sorry about the blob of text. I meant to upload in a newer version, but, and also this header, but basically we have, um, uh, so we have these helper functions, uh, BPF map trace update elements is one of them. Um, so it has the exact same signature as BPF map update element, uh, and that's by design. Um, and all it does is it, uh, it will essentially check if that pointer is not null, and if it is, it will go into it and iterate over the list of programs that are attached over the list of map update elements, uh, programs that are attached and invoke each one of them. Moving on. Um, we, so to make adoption easy, um, we 
put, we put some changes into the verifier so that um, your BPF program will have map update element and map delete element helper calls. We use the verifier to replace each one of these helper calls with logically um, BPF map update elements and then BPF map trace update element right afterwards. So the way we do this is we, we save the arguments to the say update element on the stack. We invoke the update element. We restore the arguments. Um, we save the return code. We invoke the tracing function. Then we, re we restore the return code from the actual map update helper. And then we return. Um, and because we're using additional stack space, we have to record that. And so that is it. That's all the interesting parts of the implementation. So now I just wanted to cover some open questions. Um, so the most critical one by far is that, you know, the stuff I talked about so far allows us to trace map update elements and map delete elements. And the way that we do that is we essentially, when you make those helper calls, you invoke tracers at the same point in time. The problem is that map lookup elements and also the local storage APIs return a pointer. And then applications will modify parts of the data using that pointer. Um, so if we were to do a tracing call, if we were to add a tracing call right after getting that pointer, it wouldn't have the desired effect because, of course, the actual pointer could be um, updated later on, and the tracer would not see that update. Um, so one proposed solution that I think seems like it would work is that essentially we would leave the invocation alone, um, and then we would find the exit point of the BPF program, and we would trace, um, we would invoke a tracer which takes the pointer as an argument, and then that tracer would have access to the most up-to-date version of the uh, data in that cell. And then it could just do like a mem copy of the cell over to the new version. Um, one, and we're thinking that we could do this at the source code level because doing this at the instruction level, um, essentially, you know, X is just a value sitting in a register. And then you have this entire program in the middle and now we need to find that value again. And um, in general, it wouldn't be possible to find that. Like the compiler would be free to just throw away the value right after this line of code. Um, so if we were to add a reference to that value at the source code, the compiler would make sure that the value is, you know, hangs around for long enough for long enough for us to use it. Um, so yeah, anyway, this is an open question. This is just one possible solution, but it seems workable. Um, likewise, you know, we're using the verifier to expand each map update and map delete. Um, and we just up unconditionally append these tracing calls right after them. Um, I was wondering if that seems acceptable, if we should do that conditionally according to like a flag um, or should we do this outside of the verifier altogether? Should we do that at the source code level instead of in the bytecode? Um, just curious. And finally, um, you know, we conceived of map tracing as a way of solving this upgradability problem. Um, and I'm just curious if this sounds useful to anyone else, um, especially for any use case that we haven't thought of. Now, in summary, um, yeah, so we're trying to solve the problem of unupgradable staple programs by giving maps copy on write semantics. Um, we define a set of helper functions which can evoke um, which can evoke tracing programs that are attached to maps, and we can mechanically add them to programs either in the verifier or in the source code. And this is just a recap of those open questions. Um, and thank you very much for your time.
but I'll go back to the last slide. So are there any questions or feedback? Thanks a lot for your talk. So Dave um, asked me to uh, take over the, the Q&A moderation. So if anyone has questions, please unmute or type in the, in the, in the chat that we have. Um, in the meantime, um, I would have a question, which is like if you update the, uh, like one of the programs um, where you already have uh, like the new map live and then later on you call this uh, copy on update helper, for example, how do you handle uh, the case where there would be in collision when there's already a new map element created in the new map, but the old one would still do with some sort of an update on that particular uh, entry. So do you like defer this decision to the uh, to the migration BPF program where you have this copy and write handler and then say, okay, let's just leave this alone if there's already an updated version of it or how do you, how do you handle the data transfer for that? Yeah, I mean, that would be my intuition. Um, so I think essentially it would be a case where like program one prime actually updates data in map zero prime. Um, my intuition would be that the copy on write handler would have to make the right decision and that the, whatever the right decision is would depend on the, the semantics of your application. Um, in the concrete example of Denencap, this isn't the case. The actual, uh, you know, this program one prime is a TC program and it does just read. Um, yeah, I think that's I would have to think about that more, but my intuition would be that you would want to define your copy on right, you would want to define your copy on right handler to have the right semantics. Um, yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. yeah we, we're sort of dealing with similar issues. Uh, in the case of Cilium, for example, where we have a connection tracker and we have same sort of problem. How do you migrate from one connection tracking map with this uh, particular data structure as, as values to another one, right? So yeah, you could definitely use this <laughs> mechanism as well. I mean, one thing I was wondering about as I was walking this morning was, um, you know, skeletons are really popular, came up. Um, it seems like if you could have a skeleton Basically, I'm wondering, like, so, you know, we we can add this, we can add this feature, we can make it possible to uh, define a copy on right handler, but we still have to define them. I'm thinking that we would use like the BTF of map zero and map zero prime. Like, if you had the BTF of both of these maps, you could imagine mechanically generating the right migration routine to uh, to carry the data from. Or, you know, to migrate from one format to the next. So if you simply deleted a field, you could see how you you could just define a program that like copies the data and removes that field and populates the new data and writes it into the map. Um, I'm wondering if that should be something that we do at the level of like libvpf. Um, initially, I was thinking we would just do it with like you know, internal Google application code, but it could be something what if that field deletion was actually a field rename? So you would get like seemingly a new field and also like the old field will disappear. How do you know that this is the rename? It's like, yeah, there's too much semantics there. I think that like, it's impossible to implement this for like all possible cases correctly all the time. Fair enough, yeah. And also, I mean, you could imagine, yeah, adding new fields, right? How do, what's, what's the right default? And I was wondering, like, have you tried to write like your existing programs with like existing BPF facilities in this way that like allowed to migrate their state to a different uh, map? So like, if you have array of maps, right, you can have like an active and a new map, right? And like the old program might start like writing to both with whatever custom 
logic your program has, right? And then like when you migrated everything, or actually when you activated the new program, then you can run the BPF element iterator uh, that we recently added, right? And just like copy over all the stuff that wasn't updated in the meanwhile. Like, did you try to use that approach? Because it seems like we have enough mechanisms to, to support this generically without like custom new BPF programs. I haven't tried that approach, but um, that actually does sound like something that we should consider for investing too much in this. Yeah, so look at the uh, BPF map uh, element iterator that uh, I think in Kong implemented a few months ago. So uh, yeah, that yeah, allows you to at... iterate one map and like do whatever you want with other maps, right? And in this case, probably the easiest would be like this program set v0 should just know about this possibility up front and have like array of maps where normally you would have just one map, which is like your active map, but then for the transition period you just add second map there and like notify your program somehow so it starts to write like in both places and stuff like that or maybe just one place and then look you know falls back to the old one stuff like that but i think it's just we have all the generic building blocks to 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 do this customly for every single program because i think in most generic case uh you would need like custom semantics for like what does it mean to migrate one state to another one right like you as we just discussed, like new field is added. What do you do? What if you have few maps that have to be updated in coordinated fashion under spin lock, right? Uh, how do you handle that? It's, it seems there are more questions than answers. And uh, the other point, like you, you were mentioning the uh, DFS to detect the loops, right? Mm. You use used maps. Uh, just wanted to caution you because used maps doesn't capture all the actually used maps. When you have map in map, you won't know which maps you are using. That's a pretty common thing that people forget, but you don't know all the maps in general. Okay, yeah, that is blocker. If, yeah, so used maps, okay, yeah, the problem is that basically it's just not known. The set of maps isn't known at verification time. Well, I guess, but we're doing this at, okay, I'll take a closer look. That is, Thank you for calling that out. Yeah. The, the other interesting question is maybe also like if you add something to the key itself, you have to sort of duplicate that, that value as well. And you have to have some sort of semantics in your BPF program, in your copy and write that would do this, right? And the same also like what, what, what happens if you roll back I mean, I, pre I presume you would do you would use the same mechanism here, and you would have to make a decision in that program, like how would you delete that if there's something if you remove something from the key, for example, and there are different values for like for that new key that you would potentially have. That's exactly. Tricky. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'm imagining that this would be. Um, I mean, the, the way that we define these copy on right handlers, um, would there could be a set of restrictions that we would just impose when we can mechanically generate them? Um, yeah, I mean, essentially, that's that's why I was hoping we could use mechanically generated copy on right handlers using BTF, because then essentially the new version of the map is self-describing using BTF. And we know how to migrate between two valid, um, you know, two valid opted-in maps using this mechanism. Um, but yeah, like for the reasons pointed out, it isn't one hundred percent generalizable. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm hoping that it would still be useful enough to be useful in practice. Um, I mean, you could just say, you know, you have to assume that certain fields are optional, right? When you add a new field, if you delete a field, that means that rollbacks might leave it zero initialized or something like that. Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah, like the sort of the old programs, they would have to understand this structure where you would have to just create new ones and somehow merge this if there are multiple entries to it. But 
I agree. I mean, I, I think like the migration probably needs to, like, can be done in, in, in with some simplified uh, con constraints probably, and this definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Um, there was a question from from the chat from from Tech Shack. Uh, wouldn't BPF map reuse by new programs? Uh, help to retire old programs while keeping the BPF map persistent for the new program. Yes, we're building that <laughs> currently. Um, this is essentially handling the case where we want to change the uh, we want to change something about the map, like the type, the capacity, or the layout of the map of the data in the map. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Uh, anyone else has any questions? Please speak up now. So this uh, map reuse uh, thing that, like you're saying, we want to change like the size uh, of the map and stuff like that. Uh, what about the changing of the key size and value size? You mean like change just like the amount of elements in the map or the use case is actually changing the layout of the uh, value or key? Um, so in the case where we're reusing maps, um, we don't permit anything about the map to change. Um, essentially we get a file descriptor to the map and then we use, um, I'm forgetting the name of the API. There's a way that you can override map relocations using libpf. Uh, we use that to, uh, essentially pass in the right file descriptor when we're loading the new program so that then this map zero prime is essentially pointing to map zero. Um, but see, so you, you, you are not doing that like after the program is loaded, you're doing it before it's verified, right? Uh, I'm sorry if I'm, I think I'm not understanding the question. Um, so when, when do you do this? So I think you're using like reuse map FD or something like that, right? Uh, are you doing that before the, the, the new BPF program is loaded into kernel and verified or yes, at runtime? Yes. I see. Uh, okay. Before the new ones, yeah. And I, and I think maybe like change, like and at, at least for the case where you enlarge the map, it should probably be the more straightforward case because you like if the if the key and value size and structure is retained, I think that's like <laughs> it's like probably like a simpler problem to have, right? I mean, so yeah. so I, so if if you are talking about doing that like at runtime, right? Because I think that that's the most generic one. You already have the program, then you want to replace the map. I thought that that was the use case, Daniel, that you mentioned, no? Well, anyway, my point was that okay. when we replace a uh, map at runtime after the program is validated, right? A verifier does assumption about like key size and value size. So I don't see how easily we can just change the value size because that might break the verifier logic essentially. Like, well, it, it will not break the logic. It will break the safety of the program essentially. Does it make sense? Yeah, correct. Yeah, it makes sense. Hard problems. <laughs> Okay, uh, so I presume we don't have any further questions. In that case, I would like to thank you for bringing this up. Definitely interesting topic and uh, yeah, thanks. Um, also, thanks to all the speakers from today. Uh, this concludes basically our uh, networking and BPF track for today. Um, tomorrow we are, we are back here at 7 a.m. Uh, Pacific time for the, for the next uh, batch of uh, five talks. And after today's session, just as a reminder, at um, 11 Pacific time, there will be a keynote uh, from John Maddock Hall in the, like for the general LPC that is covering like um, across all the tracks. So with that said, thanks everyone for participating and for speaking here. It was uh, really great. Awesome. And see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.